to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ but if you do not do so take note you have sinned against the lord and be sure your sins will find you out. Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23. Welcome to our study of living messages of the Old Testament. Today we're studying the book of Numbers and as we look at these various books, we really have a threefold purpose. First, we want to familiarize ourselves with these books, note the key characters, understand their meaning. But secondly, we want to look at them with an eye toward the practical. What does the book of Numbers say to us today? How does it help me to be more faithful to God? What can I look at in Numbers that will help me to overcome sin or struggles that I face? And then also, in each of these books, we want to look at them with an eye toward Christ. Can we see Christ in the book of Numbers? What work is He doing here? What type can we find that's a type of Christ to come? As you think about the book of Numbers, the key word is sojourn or wanderings. You remember in the book of Exodus, chapter 14 and chapter 17, the people began to complain. Have you brought us, they said to God, have you brought us out in this wilderness to kill us? And because of their incessant murmuring and complaining, God allowed them to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness of sin. This is that journey, that wandering. The key verse would be Numbers chapter 13, verses 32 and 33. Here's what God is trying to get across to His people to help them understand a problem they're dealing with. Notice what this text says. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they spied out saying the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature there we saw the giants the descendants of Anak came from the giants and notice and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight so we were in their sight what does God want his people to see in the book of Numbers that, that it's not about them, that it's not about their size, not about their strength, not about their power. It's about God. That if they will trust God, no matter how big the enemy, no matter how great the trouble may be, God can deliver them. And hasn't God shown that? God delivered them completely out of the Egyptian army through the ten plagues, captured their army in the Red Sea and crushed them, and yet they still haven't fully learned to trust God. In fact, the key phrase to the book, which occurs 13 times, God says, because you believe me not. It wasn't that they didn't believe there was a God. It wasn't that they maybe didn't even understand that God could do those things, but practically and daily, they weren't living in view of that belief. Because God is who He is, because He's done what He's done, I don't have to worry and I don't have to wonder, I don't have to doubt, I don't have to have a grasshopper complex. I can trust God and I believe that through Him I can do all things. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. As we think about the book of Numbers, the key theme which the book of Numbers expresses is that unbelief will keep one from entering the promised land. Why are these people all from 20 years and up, why are they going to have to wander and their bodies waste away in the wilderness? Because their unbelief. Their lack of trust in God was the sin. Their sin was they were going to wander and die in that wilderness. Such a practical lesson for us is that unbelief will also keep many of God's children out of that heavenly home. We're not just talking about not believing in God, but living your life as though you don't believe in Him. Oh, we may go to worship, we may say we believe in God, may even have a Bible in our home, but does our life prove 
that we believe in God. When difficult times come, do we know God's going to take care of us? Uh, when we face issues or struggles, do we understand God's going to be there? Do we really trust God and do we live for Him each and every day? That's the powerful message Numbers expresses to us. And so the key application, beware. Beware of unbelief in your life and in mine. Notice the words of Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. The Hebrew writer says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Here's the application. Don't let unbelief, don't let practical atheism keep you from entering heaven. These people believed in God. They'd seen His signs. They'd seen His power. Had you asked the Israelite, do you believe in God? It would have been a resounding yes. But were they living their life like there was a God? Absolutely not. They're murmuring and complaining. They aren't trusting God. They're not following the guidance He gives Him. And so in a mental sense, yes, they believe in God. They acknowledge Him. But in everyday life, they're living like there is no God. And thus, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, Each of us must take heed lest we also fall. And so the application is powerful for Christians today. Now, here's a division of, an outline of the book of Numbers. Chapters 1 through 10, you've got preparations for Can Canaan land, the Canaan land, that are made at Sinai. There's some final preparations that must be made at Sinai. Then chapters 11 through 21, you've got from Sinai to Moab, the wanderings that they make. And then chapters 22 through 36, we've got from Moab, all the, way to, all the way to the very border of Canaan itself. And so there's a great distance that goes on during Numbers and much of that is aimless wanderings because of the people's sins. Now, is Numbers a practical book like many of the other books we've seen? Absolutely it is. One of the most powerful lessons that we learn is the vow of separation that is made in Numbers chapter 6. The, the vow of the Nazarites separating themselves from certain things, not cutting their hair, not drinking or eating wine or grape juice, things of that nature, not getting defiled with something unclean, not touching anything that they shouldn't. The people who were going to choose that lifestyle, they had to make a, a vow, a solemn oath, that they were going to live a special life of separation from things of this world and that they were going to give themselves absolutely in service to God. Now someone says, well, how's a Nazarite vow practical for us today? We're not making Nazarite vows, but have we not, if we're children of God, have we not promised and made an oath that will be separated from this world? Have we not said to God, I'm going to leave the things of this world behind, I'm going to put my past behind me, and I'm going to give myself fully to you? Look at the words of Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, and notice that's exactly what we must do. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, <clears throat> by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Look at the language used. Christians are a living sacrifice, unlike the dead sacrifices that gave their life in the book of Leviticus. We're a living sacrifice every day. I've got to be reminded, I've made a vow, I've made a promise to God, I'm going to sacrifice my life for Him. You've got to say to yourself, listen carefully, if you're going to live for God, you have got to say to yourself every day, this old world, this old life is no longer about me. Here's how Paul put it, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? Listen. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, watch this, which are His. Who do I belong to? I'm not my own. Paul said in Galatians 2 verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. 
It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Life's no longer about me. I've got to seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, I've got to have the attitude of Paul in Philippians 1, for to me, to live is Christ and to die, that's only a gain. Remember, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. We are God's own peculiar people. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 13. And so like the Nazarites, we made a vow. Let's fulfill that vow and be faithful to God. Again in the book of Numbers, we see the peril of complaining. They didn't learn their lesson in the book of Exodus. Numbers chapter 11 and Numbers chapter 14, the process starts again. They began to complain about the food. They began to complain about water. They began to complain about other things. And ultimately, they're questioning God's integrity. Now that's, again, a practical lesson as well because in the Lord's church, we've got a lot of these people's kinfolks. We've got a lot of complainers, a lot of grumblers, people who can't be made happy in any way, shape, or form. Friends, we need to realize what Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14 teaches us. We need to do all things without murmuring and complaining. Listen, that doesn't say some things. That doesn't say what comes easy or what you like. That says do all things without murmuring and complaining so that we can be blameless as sons of God. If I'm going to be pure in God's sight, complaining and murmuring is not what God wants me to do. Now, another passage that stands out to us is the passage in Numbers chapter 13, verses 32 and 33. Here you've got the ten spies. Twelve have gone out. Ten come back with a bad report. Sure, the land you sent us into, it's indeed a land flowing with milk and honey, but the people there are giants. We look like grasshoppers in our own sight. Surely we do in theirs. The problem the people had was that they had what we might call a grasshopper complex. They thought everybody was bigger, everybody was stronger, and everybody was going to conquer them, and no matter what happened, they wouldn't win. They failed to factor in God. Sure, without God's help, without God in our lives, things would seem small. Everything would begin to look like a mountain. But friends, we don't have to worry about those things. We don't have to have a, a grasshopper complex because we do have God on our side. Listen to the words of Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. The Apostle Paul said this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How is it that we can overcome the, the giants in our life? How is it that we can uh, walk away and still be victorious even when we live in a sinful world, when Satan looks like an adamant foe and he is? How can we have the victory? I can do all things through Christ. 1 John 4 verse 4 and 5 verse 4 says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world, thus our faith is our victory. I can be victorious because I have God on my side. Christ is with us and He's promised to help us and thus we can walk away victoriously if we put our trust and our hope in God. You know, a great character in the book of Numbers is the great man Caleb. Joshua and Caleb were the two spies who brought back a good report. They said, it is a land, they've got giants, but we can defeat them. Let's go in and conquer it. And you've got to love Caleb. Caleb, great man of God, in essence says, I'm ready to go. Give me my mountain. I'm ready to overtake it. Look at what Caleb says in Numbers chapter 14. And I want you to notice verse 24. But my servant, the scripture says, Caleb, he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully. I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it." Aged in years. Caleb says, I'm just as strong now as I ever was. Let's go up and with God's help we'll do it. And God says, that's my man. That's the one I'm looking for. I'm going to bless him and I'm going to bless his descendants because he didn't let the mountain outshadow God. He didn't let the giants Keep them from seeing, keep him from seeing that God would work with him. Friends, how we've got to realize that God will help us, that God will take care of us, and that we've not been left alone. Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18, he's able to come to the aid of those who suffer because he himself 
has been tempted. Jesus has gone through this life and He knows the trials, the struggles that we face. Hebrews 4 verse 15, and thus if we'll have the attitude, I'm going to do it and I know God's going to help me. That's the kind of person that God is looking for. Now, another important message that we see in the book of Numbers is that Moses, that, that great servant of God, is not allowed to go into the Canaan land. You know, this is a sad scene. Numbers chapter 20 verse 12 says this, God said, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Well, why was Moses not allowed to go in? Moses wasn't permitted to go in because God said, Moses, I want you to speak to the rock. And Moses got angry at the people's murmuring, got tired of their complaining, and he took it out on the rock and he struck it. And God said, nope, you've not hallowed me, you've not trusted me, you've not revered me in these people's sight. Friends, sin will always keep men and women from reaching that ultimate home, from reaching that Canaan land home, that heavenly home. Jesus taught in Luke 13 verses 3 and 5, unless we repent, we'll all likewise perish. Think about men who were hindered by sin in the Bible. I want you to think about David, a, a, a great man of God, man after God's own heart, and yet David committed murder in essence. He had her husband, Bathsheba's husband, murdered. He committed adultery. He did heinous things. Uh, think about Achan. He lied. He stole that Babylonian garment, that bar of gold, hid it under his tent. Think about Saul. Saul had great potential, and yet he would not fully obey the will of God. Judas allowed greed to get in his heart, allowed Satan in his life, and, and he couldn't be the one God wanted him to be. He, he fell away because of that. Sin, like with men of old, will permit us from making it to heaven if we're not careful. Friend, let's realize just how serious God is about sin. God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 7 and verse 11. God hates sin because of what it does to His people and He does not want us to live in sin. But then I want you to notice from Numbers chapter 23 verses 19 and 20, I want us to see not only God in His power, in His miracles, and the things that He does, but I want us to see the, the complete and powerful nature of God's Word. Look at what is said in Numbers 23 beginning in verse 19. The scripture says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed. I cannot reverse it. God's not a man. He's not going to lie. He's not going to change his will. When God says something, listen carefully, when God says it, you can be sure of it. You can take it to the bank. That's the way it's going to be. Now, friends, God has spoken in His Word. And we must realize this Word is full and complete in its nature. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, God says, Do not add to, do not take away, lest I add to you the condemnations of this book, lest, book, lest I take away from you the blessings that are in it. God's Word has everything God wanted it to have. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6, we're not to go beyond that which is written. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine or proof correction that the man of God may be complete. There's the idea. Psalm 119, 160 says this, The entirety of your Word is truth. This book, just like the very voice of God, has everything we need. It's complete. I love the words of 2 Peter 1 verse 3. God has given to us through His divine knowledge all things pertaining to life and godliness. You want to know how to live the best life? It's right here. Jesus said in John 10 verse 10, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. You want to know how to be a godly person? It's right here. This book has everything you need to live a perfect life, to live a godly life, and to get to heaven. And so let's realize the power and nature of God's Word. Then I want you to notice this from Numbers. Highly practical lesson found in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. It's this. Sin is inescapable. 
You will never outrun. You'll never outfly. You cannot get away from your sins no matter how fast you go, no matter how deep you go. You can't run from the sin problem. Numbers 32, 23 says, But if you do not do so, then take note. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure, be sure, your sin will find you out. can't hide sin from God. Do you remember the famous couple who tried to hide their sin from God? Seen in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Did you sell the land for such and such? Oh yes, we sold it for that. Drop dead on the spot. She comes in a little while later. Did you sell the land for such and such? You bet we did. There's those who carried your husband out. Let him carry you out too. She dropped dead on the spot. Tried to lie to God and it just didn't work. Friend, we've got to realize that we cannot. We cannot lie to God. God knows and God sees all things. Sin is inescapable. And here's why. Because of the all-seeing, all-knowing nature of God. Hebrews 4 verses 12 through 14 teaches us that all things are open and naked before the eyes of Him with whom we must give an account. There's no creature hidden from His sight. God knows and sees all things. Proverbs 15 verse 1, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 and 14, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's life all about? Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why? For God will bring every work into judgment, listen, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. God even knows the secret things, the things that you may have got away with that nobody else knows. It's going to find you out because God knows. And friend, how we need to be sure that if there are things that we've done that are sinful, oh, how we desperately need to make that right. You know, you may think you can fool your parents. You may fool the church. You may fool the elders and the preacher. You may fool everybody. But it will come back to haunt you if you don't deal with it. Jesus said there is a place called hell. It is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Mark 9 verse 44. And people who don't repent of sin and think they're going to get away with it, that's where people go. They go to that place and thus deal with sin before it's everlastingly too late. Now, let's think just a little differently now for just a moment. Let's shift gears and let's think about the third application, the third idea we have in looking at these books, and that is to see Christ in the book of Numbers. Can we see Christ in this wonderful book? You bet we can. Numbers chapter 9 verse 12, Of the Lamb that was to be offered, not one of its bones was to be broken. Well, is there anything in the Scripture about Jesus, bones not being broken? Look in John 19, verses 33 through 36. The Scripture says, But when they came to Jesus and saw that He was already dead, they did not break His legs, but one of the soldiers pierced His side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, his testimony is true, and he knows he is telling the truth so that you may believe. Now notice, for these things were done that the Scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. Jesus is that Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, like the lamb in Numbers 9, 12, not one of his bones was broken. Numbers chapter 19, verse 3, the sacrifice was to be made outside the camp. Hebrews 13, 12, Jesus was sacrificed outside the camp. What about that rock that followed them in Numbers chapter 20? Do you remember 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4? Jesus was that rock. But then there's one specifically that I want us to think about. I want you to think for just a moment about that bronze serpent. Still the sign in the medical world today. That bronze serpent set up in Numbers chapter 21, verses 6 through 10. You remember, they'd begun to complain, so God sent fiery serpents in among them. The serpents began to bite them, bite them and people started to die. And so, as they always did, they cry out to God, and God makes a way of escape. He tells Moses, you build this bronze serpent, this bronze snake, and whoever gets bit, wherever they are, if they find the serpent, look at it, they'll be saved. And so there were steps they had to take, but God made a way of escape. Now, what in the world has that got to do with Christ? Did you know 
that the golden verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, which so many people misuse, actually comes from the bronze serpent. Let's look at John 3, verses 14 through 17 together. The scripture says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. What's the background to John 3.16? Friends, it comes right out of Numbers 21. That bronze serpent, think about what they had to do. Okay, here's someone in the camp of Israel gets bit by a viper. They're going to die if they don't find that serpent. What if they just say to themselves, you know, I really don't know where the serpent is, but I believe. Was that enough? Was it enough just to have it up here? Uh-uh. They had to stop what they were doing. They had to physically find that serpent, and they had to look at it. There were steps they had to take, things they had to do to be saved. That's the context of John 3, 16. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him, not just believes up here, but is willing to do whatever God says. That's the person who will be saved. When we talk about salvation, we talk about believing in Jesus, it's so much more than just mouthing words or having some facts up here. It's a 100% commitment. I'm going to do whatever Jesus says to be saved. John 2, verse 5, whatever He tells you, do it. Well, let's ask then, what does Jesus tell us to do to be saved? Well, Jesus tells us we've got to believe His Word. The Scripture clearly teaches, Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. If I don't believe the Word of God, and I don't believe in Jesus as the Son of God, I can't be saved. Well, what else does Jesus tell us? Jesus tells us we've got to repent. Unless you repent you'll all likewise perish. Jesus tells us we've got to confess Him before men. Matthew 10 verses 32 and 33. And Jesus tells us to believe in Him. We must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus said it so plainly. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, have you fully trusted God? Do you believe in God in the sense in which the Bible speaks of? Not just up here, but by following Him living for Jesus Christ each and every day. You know, the people in the book of Numbers suffered because of unbelief. Are you suffering because of unbelief? If so, won't you obey the gospel and make it right before it's everlastingly too late? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're the concerned about lost souls, not your own. And to God be the glory. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.